Good morning, guys. Uh, as, as you can tell by my ac my sexy accent, I'm from the U.S. So <laughs> well, let's. <laughs> All right. Well, my name is Mohammed Bar. I was born from in Freetown, Sierra Leone. I came to the U.S. when I was 14. And most of you guys wondering, okay, how do I wind up in the U.S. Air Force? Well, growing up from Freetown. Sierra Leone has been going, going on with a civil war since 1991, when I was seven, and ended back in 2002. Well, the reason, be, the reason behind the civil war was the military itself, half of them, the government military rebelled against the government, claiming they wasn't, they wasn't getting paid enough. So they tried about three attempts to overthrow the government. Most of the time, they didn't succeed. So they wound up... Um, the rebel commander himself became a friend of Charles Taylor, who's, who was a former president of Liberia. And both of these guys are best of friends, and they received their training from Libya and Ivory Coast. But their intention in the beginning of the civil war was, OK, now all they're going to do was just to get hold of the government. They have no intention of killing any, killing any innocent civilians whatsoever. Well, their plan, their plan failed once. They tried again. So once the government find out the, the rebels was doing this, so the, the president himself actually invite foreign troops, just like in Yusefi, we have like NATO troops. Like whenever um, if England or Turkey need help, we all have to come in as, as one to help them out. And these foreign troops that actually came in are well trained and have more weapons. So the rebel leader decide him, him and his troops to seize the whole diamond area. So now when he See this whole area, he started using the diamonds and mineral resources as foreign exchange to get weapons. And these other countries already know what was going on, so they actually imposed, imposed a sanction in Freetown, saying, okay, no plane can leave and nothing can go out, nothing can um, comes in, nothing comes in. So Charles Taylor, the mastermind behind this, told the rebel commander, like, okay, since I'm a president right now, you can actually use my airport and use my port to receive your weapons. So they started receiving their um, weapons from Ukraine, Russia, through um, Monrovia. And when, when they receive it, they actually drive through the border, tr trucking it, giving it to the rebels. So they were using that to fight against um, the foreign troops and the government troops themselves. So time, time goes on. Now the rebels um, became frustrated because even with all the weapons that they have, they, their plans still keep failing. So now they start um, taking their frustration on, in, on innocent civilians, like drugging people, that, uh, drugging guys, females, giving them guns, raping, killing, you name it. It comes to a point they actually start um, doing um, like checkpoints. So if you're driving out, they're going to stop the vehicle. And they have like a rifle, like, a, like some kind of a rifle going on. So if, if they stop your vehicle, you actually have to come in, come in and choose one. So what, whatever you picked up, they're going to ask you to open it. So if you open it, if it is long sleeve, they're ch chopping your, hands up, your hand off, saying, since you're supporting the government, now you have no hands to go vote or do whatever you, you always do in, as your normal life. So that keeps going on, going on, going on, raping them now. One of my one of my experience actually was a, fr a friend of mine got caught by the rebels themselves in Freetown, and they act actually asked him to rape his own mom, and he refused. So what they wind up doing to the like, okay, since you don't want to do what we're telling you, guess what? The ch both of his sons get chopped off and chopped his ear off, and sl slaughter his mom right in front of him. But for me, I've seen, I've seen all that growing up. But my turning point was on a Thursday morning in 1999. I came from a family. I have a mom, a dad, seven older brothers, uncle and aunt. And I'm the only one alive standing in front of you. How this happened, I left, I left my house on Thursday morning. And out of, the eight, out of my eight kids, I was the baby of the house. So like every morning when we wake up, we always go to the dining table, just like as family always do, have breakfast before everyone goes out. So when I, when I wake up that Thursday morning and have, have breakfast, I left everyone in, my, in the dining table. 
The last thing my mom was telling me, like, have, have fun. So I left. While I was in school, things get heated between the foreign troops and the rebels themselves. Guns start going off, you name it. It was a whole chaos. People smoke, people, kids crying, everyone just screaming and hollering. So we left the classroom and walked out, just trying to find out what was going on. So as I'm walking by, looking, look, looking on the road, seeing like in front, just laying down in front, of, don't even know what's going on. Seeing like dead peop, people um, being shot at, dead, no leg, no hands, l l lose their visions, you name it. So at that time, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, okay, hopefully my family, I'm, I'm more worried about what's going on right now, but at the same time, I'm thinking of going back home just to make sure my, my, my family was all right. So I keep walking. They actually stopped us. So we stopped. There was a pregnant lady actually walking by. These two rebels actually stopped her. And these two guys was making a bet. And now let's just keep in mind, these two guys never been, even been to med school. This one saying, okay, she's going to have a baby boy. This one saying, no, she's going to have a baby girl. They bet just like for like 20 bucks just to figure out who's who going to win. I remember like it was like yesterday. Me standing right in front, standing there, seeing this guy taking a, a bayonet, stabbing this lady. So I left. I went home. The first thing I looked at, because we live in a house, the, the whole area was like just like, like a war zone. Everything was just, you don't see anything but rubbles and smoke. So when I went in, the thing that happened in less than 24 hours in my life on that Thursday morning, I was in shock. Now let's keep in mind at the age of 14, I wasn't expecting that. To so come home, like, as a, as a kid, you're coming home from school, you're all happy. Going back to mom and dad, get a big hug. So when I came in, come to find out my mom, the entire family that I left in the, din in the dining room table when I left, mom, dad, seven brothers, uncle, aunt, and cousin, everyone, everyone is gone. Get, they get wiped out. So I looked, I was in shock. I was passed out. So my dad's best friend actually came, him and his family, family, because he already knew what was going on, looking for us. So when he came, the only thing I could recall after that was him taking, tr trying to um, revive me to make sure I'm alive, pouring some water and checking my pores. So when I looked up, he actually went around and checking for pauses. Him and, him and his family actually came back crying and said, hey, guess what? You the baby of the house, you the last one, and you the last one, so you the last one standing. So at that time, at the age of 14, I'm like, hey, what do you mean? He said, get, they, whatever you have now, they're all dead. You're the only one left. So I'm like, okay. So he said, but like, what I'm about to do, we're not going to leave them here, because you're already saying that the other ones in the street being eaten by dogs. So we're going to pay, pay their last respect. So he calls um, some other people around, help them out. We went to the cemetery, burying them. Lo and behold, no, no one knows that the rebels themselves actually was, they was in the cemetery because it was well trained, they know how to ambush people. So while we're done trying to go back, they start shooting. And some of the guys at the cemetery that was with me, some survive and some don't survive. For me, the bullet grazed me one here, and one on my thigh, and one on my head. So I dropped. I, lo I lose it for like, for like a few minutes. Because I was still in, I was still in shock about the whole thing that I've seen and coming home, seeing what, what, I, what I had was gone in less than 24 hours. So I, would, I was out of it. So I tried to get up again to work, and somebody was right behind me, hitting, hitting me with a gun. So I dropped again. So as time goes on, I get up, and with some of the, um, the other guys that was with me at the cemetery, we all get up, some limping, some ble bleeding to death. To that. We're like, okay, let, let's just go. we we'll seek help. That's when the UN and the International Red Cross are driving by just to pick up survive, people who survived. We get picked up, took us to a hospital. But before even that, I have a lady that was with me. She actually took her scarf and, and time trying to time at my leg just to stop the bleeding because I was bleeding too bad. So we got the help from the UN, 
and the International Red Cross, it took us to the neighboring country, which was Guinea. So now, I'm in a refugee camp. I don't even know what's going on. It's my first time ever being in a refugee camp with people with no legs, with no hands, no, no vision, like mentally gone. So I was getting all the medical treatment um, that I wanted, but at the same time, we have um, some mental health professionals and, psych and psychiatrists just to make sure, not only if you're physically all right, just to make sure if you're mentally, mentally all right. But for me, for, for six months, I was off because it was still like a nightmare. So as time goes on, they're like, okay, I receive all the treatment that I need. So the UN entered, they're like, okay, now what do you guys want? So now some of the guys that, that was at the camp was still frustrated. They were like, okay, me, we don't deserve this. We have no hands in politics, so why, why me? So that was the question. So most of them want to go back to revenge. So, but one of the, um, the psychiatrists was like, okay, how are you going to go fight back if you don't have no hands? It already happened. So they were like, you, what do you want? I'm like, well, for me, I just want to go to school. So I stayed at the camp with, with the UN for about six to seven months. Towards the eight months, they were like, hey, you're going to the US, and some of you guys going to Australia, some of you guys going to Europe. But if you're over the age of 18, when you, if you go to the US or wherever you go, you have to repay the government back for, for your visa, like a monthly payment. You have about six to 12 months. When you get stable and get a job, you start paying them back. So for me, since I was, since I was a minor, I don't have to pay anything back. So the guy walks up to me, I'm like, okay, you going to the US? I'm like, how? Somebody sponsoring you. A foster home agency like Lutheran Children Family Service is going to be sponsoring you. So I wound up and came, coming to the US back in April of 2000. And my social worker actually picked me up from the airport, from the airport driving home. She looks at me and she's like, hey, what? She was like, what do you want to do when you grow up? So I'm like, I just gave her a look like I'm on, I want to join the military. So she gave me a look like, OK, you crazy. <laughs> so, so we left. I went to my first. She, she took me to my foster, foster family. And my foster dad, actually, he was in the Army Reserve. When 9-11 um, hit, he was the first one to go down range for about 15 months. So I was home with his wife and the rest of the family. But I still wanted to join the military, so I wound up and um, they sent me to school. So I did um, my junior and my senior year. Then right after that, I'm, I'm still um, anxious. I'm like, OK, now, since I'm 18, I'm going to join the military just to give back, giving back to the government. But when I told my, my foster mom and my foster dad that I'm, I'm like, hey, I'm going to join the military, my foster dad gave me a look like, yeah, I, I won't believe it until I see it. So the same question again, like, why do you want to join the military? Haven't you, haven't you seen enough? I'm like, I, I want to do it. So I was in school, fin finished from high school, so I was in college for two years, still waiting for my green card and to, to, to enlist in the military. As time goes on, I wait, 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 wait. Two years went by, and I finally received my green card. So I, w I went up to New York. On my way to um, at 125th in Harlem, I came across an, an Air Force recruiter. She was working out of the office, office with her supervisor. I'm like, you in the Air Force? And she was like, yeah. She was like, well, yeah, she want to join? I'm like, yeah. So she laughed. So she took me into, into the office. She asked all the questions about my green card, high school diploma. If I, if, if, if I have it, I'm like, yeah, I do. So she called my school. She's like, hey, can I please have a transcript? So then they wound up telling, oh, yeah, being that English is not his first language, she was taking um, remedial classes. So that doesn't count. So now I become more frustrated. But then again, looking back at what, what I went through, I'm like, okay, and it, it's not enough. Everything in life happened for a reason. So I left him um, for BMT in November 2006. My first assignment was in Dover, Delaware. Came to Dover, Delaware, applied for my citizenship, then got deployed, my first deployment, which I'm like, okay, this is what I want to I wanna do. But I was looking for people to deploy, so I volunteer for it. So I was, my first deployment was with the US Army unit from Fort Bragg, MCT. So I went, um, I went to Wisconsin for training for a month and went down range from August 08 to February 09. Came back, told my supervisor, I'm like, look, if you have any more, if you guys have a um, deployment coming up, sign me up. Hell, like, well, I'm like, I just want to volunteer to go back down range. So got deployed again from November 2010, from November 2009, I mean, to 
June 2010. Same mission, but with a different unit. Came back, then they were like, okay, you have an assignment. I'm like, where? So my supervisor trying to prank me, and they were like, yeah, you're going to rush here. I'm like, no, I'm, I'm not. And I'm like, okay, you go, you're going to talk here. I'm like, okay, then I'm, I will take it. So I've been here since April of last year, for 15 months, and now I wind up extending. So I was supposed to be leaving the end of this month, but I'm here until Ju July of next year now. I know most of you guys are wondering why am I doing this? Why am I, why am I standing up in front of you to tell my story? One, let's get one thing out, out of the window. I'm not trying to be famous. Not at all. I'm not trying to be famous. The, re the reason why I'm doing it, just to, let just, just to let you know, you can't, no one can stop you from achieving your goals or your dreams, but you. No matter what, um, what kind of obstacles you go through in life, don't let that stop you. Always believe that there's, there's, there's hope, always have hope, and don't give up. And for me, yeah, I lost my family back home, but now I, ha I have another family, which is in the U.S. Air Force. And I have no regret since I ever came in. And for some of the guys that are about to retire, for some of the old folks, including Chief Dykes, <laughs> that, that are about to retire, please, please, please keep in touch. Even if you, even if you live and um, you're trying to retire, but we need your mentorship. But if you've been here for 20 plus years, we, we need that guidance from you um, saying, hey, this is what you need to do, this is what you need to do. And for the guys that are just coming in, we all volunteer. No one forced us to come in here for, to join the military. Again, with the exception of Chief, Chief Dykes, and I'm not going to get in trouble for this, but no, I'm good. <laughs> I mean, for the newcomers in the military, if you don't like your job, Talk to your supervisor, talk to your flight chief, follow your chain of command, you just try to cross run or maybe apply for special duty assignment. You came in with a clean record, try to leave with a clean record. Because for one, it's a, it's a small air force. If you don't like what you do, you might have a four, a four, four in your EPR, maybe a three in your EPR for you, it's not the end of the world. You can bounce back and do, and, and do, and do the best you can the best you can do. Don't let anyone stop you from achieving moving. And thanks for your time.